Chair of State, Ministry of Communications and Information, and Ministry of Health Government with Dr. Janil Puducherry. A very good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Singapore International Cyber Week. Today we are going to have the International IoT Security Roundtable Leadership Dialogue 2022. I would also like to extend a very warm welcome to all of our virtual guests viewing from all around the world. My name is Juliana Yao, and it is my privilege to be your host for today. So the theme for this year's Leadership Dialogue is the internationalization of IoT standards and certification framework. This year's IoT event aims to gather professionals to galvanize international efforts towards internationalizing a common IoT standard to prevent standard fragmentation, eradicate duplicated evaluation, to reduce the cost of compliance across borders as well as to facilitate export. We will see distinguished speakers and panelists discuss the future of cybersecurity, avenues of cooperation and innovation. So to begin the conference proceedings, it gives me great pleasure to invite our guests of honor, Dr. Janil Futucheri, Senior Minister of State, Ministry of Communications and Information, and Ministry of Health Government Whip to deliver his opening address. Dr. Janil, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you and thank you for joining us at the International IoT Security Roundtable of our seventh Singapore International Cyber Week. I was I was just commenting, this is an extraordinarily large room for the size of our gathering. I think we're taking the concept of an air gap a little bit too far. Oh, only certain jokes you can crack in this sort of environment. As I was walking in, someone asked me if I was going to deliver my speech from a piece of paper or my iPad, and I said I'll do it from my iPad unless it was already been hacked. Um, and again, a few events where that gets a round of nervous laughter as opposed to uh, real laughter. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop trying to be a stand-up comic and actually do the work that I was tasked to do. It's the first time since the pandemic that we've been able to gather everybody in person for this roundtable. And I thank you all for your support, your contribution to the Internet of Things security ecosystem. And especially those of you that have taken the trouble to come here to Singapore in person, not just to attend the events, but also to meet your counterparts um, and fellow cybersecurity professionals uh, from around the world. The market that we're thinking about, the IoT market, has been growing rapidly. By some estimates, 50 billion IoT devices in use around the world by 2030. And it's very much part of our lives. Um, as everyday citizens, more and more smart devices are appearing in our homes, digital locks, lighting, kitchen appliances, refrigerators, microwaves, and very important to some of us, our coffee machines are now internet connected. Many of you will use smart home hubs to control these with your mobile devices and app on your mobile phones. Outside of our homes, these devices are also being used to change the way we think about and manage our cities. In Singapore, we've deployed smart lampposts that help to detect environmental conditions, the lighting conditions, the traffic conditions. And these give us data and allow us to make better decisions for urban planning, sometimes well in advance, sometimes near real time. Looking abo abroad, there are examples where this near real time data is used to manage traffic. For example, the traffic lights in 
parts of Pittsburgh used to monitor and control traffic flows. And we're getting to the stage where these can now be evaluated and documented to have a very significant real-world positive impact. In the case of Pittsburgh, reducing intersection waiting times by 41%, reducing vehicle emissions by 21%. On a very personal level in medicine, these devices, ECG monitors, pacemakers, they're getting smarter as the, the technology, the professionals seek to leverage on, improve our ability to collect patient data, deliver therapy, and customize therapy. But when we are designing and developing these devices, the usual priorities are efficiency, convenience, effectiveness, and not necessarily the security and safety of the users. The lack of strong IoT security can pose serious risks. Many of our consumer IoT devices contain a cache of data, consumer data and information that if leaked, compromised, significantly impacts their consumer privacy. There have been cases over the last couple of years where unsecured home security cameras in Singapore were hacked and the stolen footage sold online. In severe cases, IoT hacks can lead to serious physical harms, even risking lives. In one potential hypothetical scenario, thankfully to my knowledge not realized, in 2017, the FDA discovered a serious vulnerability in pacemakers made by St. Jude Medical, which would have made it possible for threat actors to hack the pacemakers, alter its functioning, deplete its battery, and potentially administer shocks to the wearer. For these and many other reasons, we have to take IoT security very seriously. In Singapore, we've introduced the cybersecurity labeling scheme in 2020 to provide a way for consumers to make more informed choices when buying these IoT devices. A higher rating in this tiered scheme means a more secure device. And in this way, we hope to be able to guide and encourage IoT device manufacturers to make their products with cybersecurity in mind and differentiate themselves from their competitors. This cybersecurity labeling scheme is open for all consumer IoT devices, Wi-Fi routers, smart home hubs, household appliances, the internet-connected coffee maker. Since then, since 2020, the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore has received more than 300 applications and has certified more than 200 products. The CLS has also gained traction internationally. Singapore and Finland have now an agreement to mutually recognize each other's IoT cybersecurity labels. And I'm proud to say that since the signing, uh, ASUS's products have received the Finnish cybersecurity labels, while Signify and Polar, Signifies and Polar's products, these are Finnish companies, have received the cybersecurity labels. So they're, all the products that have been mutually recognized are now recognized in both Singapore and Finland for meeting these cybersecurity standards. And this year, I'm pleased to announce that Singapore will be signing a mutual recognition agreement with Germany after this roundtable to mutually recognize the cybersecurity labels issued by our cybersecurity agency and the Federal Office for Information Security in Germany, their BSI. This mutual recognition will further promote the harmonization of standards, reduce duplicated testing, and costs for manufacturers globally, and improve market access for consumer IoT manufacturers between Germany and Singapore. This MRA, this Mutual Recognition Agreement, will first start with consumer devices, such as cameras, TVs, health trackers, and we hope that this list will grow over time as our CSA and Germany's BSI work through the various product categories. In addition to signing these MRAs with countries with similar schemes, Singapore has been working with industry and government partners to put up a proposal to develop an international standard, ISO 27404, which defines a universal cybersecurity labeling framework, the UCLF, for consumer IoT. This framework will serve as a guide for countries that are looking to implement and set up their own labeling schemes for consumer IoT and will facilitate future 
mutual recognition across countries as existing standards within the country would already be harmonized with this universal cybersecurity labeling framework. As was mentioned by Senior Minister Chiu Chi Hen at his welcome remarks for Singapore International Cyber Week, CSA, the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore, in collaboration with our Ministry of Health, our Health Sciences Authority, and the Integrated Health Information Systems, will be extending our cybersecurity labeling scheme to medical devices, appropriately called CLS-MD. This scheme was developed in consultation with MNCs and SME representatives from the Asia Pacific Medical Technology Association and the Singapore Manufacturing Federation's Medical and Technology Industry Group. And this will apply to medical devices that can handle sensitive data or are able to connect to other devices, systems, and services. Like the CLS, the new CLS MD label will enable consumers and healthcare providers to identify more medical devices that with better inbuilt cybersecurity and we hope incentivize manufacturers to develop more secure medical devices the same way that they have done for consumer IoT. For a start, medical devices that meet HA's, uh, our, our Health Sciences Authority's cybersecurity requirements will be deemed as compliant to level one and devices that meet a more stringent cybersecurity standards should receive a higher level. So we'll have an industry consultation process to seek feedback on these proposed requirements for the higher levels and we'll announce more details in due course. We are making good progress on IoT security, but we cannot rest on our laurels. We cannot be satisfied with the status quo. The technology landscape is constantly evolving. The Opportunities as well as the threats are accelerating and as digitalization becomes more urgent under the challenges coming out of COVID and the various things that are happening in the world today, we have to make sure that our approach to IoT security keeps up. We have to continue to work together to identify the risks and the threats within our IoT ecosystem. And we have to establish strong partnerships and collaborations to see these threats and turn them into opportunities. To do so, we are very much grateful for our friends and partners from other governments, industries around the world, committed to our joint cause, and you've given your strong and unwavering support. On this note, I'd like to conclude by wishing all of you an enriching set of conversations and discussions at this round table today, and I hope that we can continue to take the opportunity of occasions like today to build these partnerships for our efforts tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. Now, we would like to invite Ms. Ann Neuberger, Deputy Assistant to the President and Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technology for the National Security Council at the White House. She is giving us a keynote address on IoT security and international collaboration from a U.S. perspective via a pre-recorded video. Let's roll the video, please. Hello everyone and greetings from the White House. My name is Anne Neuberger and I'm the US Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber and Emerging Technologies. While I'm disappointed that I cannot be with you today in Singapore, I'm pleased to be able to join you virtually and share some of the Biden-Harris administration's priorities in the cyber and emerging technology space. Focusing in on the importance of Internet of Things security and how we can work together to achieve our collective goals in this space. I want to thank Singapore for its consistent leadership in this space and recognize Minister Putucheri for his remarks this morning, which set the stage for this important discussion. I also want to thank my close, close colleague, David Koh, Commissioner of Cybersecurity and Chief Executive of the Cybersecurity Agency, with whom I work closely on a breadth of cybersecurity issues. David's leadership and thought leadership in the cyber and tech space is something all of us around the world value. 
When the, Biden, when the Biden-Harris administration came into office, the president emphasized the importance of cyber and tech issues from a national security perspective. Oftentimes, in both hardware and software, security is an afterthought or becomes the responsibility of the user. My favorite analogy is the seatbelts in a car. We'd never buy a car without any seatbelts, or one where the manufacturer just expected us to install and maintain them ourselves. There's no reason for us to accept this approach in technology either. So one of our key efforts is upping baked-in cybersecurity. We've done this first for software through the President's Executive Order on Cybersecurity, using the purchasing power of the government to try to lift the standard for software products. Consumers purchase as well. Building in security from the beginning is critical, and we're now expanding our focus to make progress on some of the most ubiquitous connected items, Internet of Things devices. We've seen a boon in technology in the past 10 years, relying on Internet of Things devices to connect us to the Internet for work, tell us the weather before we leave the house, and provide us security when we aren't home. From baby monitors to connected home appliances, the number of global Internet of Things devices has grown exponentially year over year. These devices offer consumers, businesses, and governments convenience and novel functionality. Yet they've also served to amplify a range of cybersecurity risks to data, networks, critical infrastructure, and the Internet ecosystem writ large. One of the principal reasons why is that IoT products are often built with security as an afterthought. These poorly secured products can enable attackers to gain footholds in corporate or otherwise sensitive environments and steal data or cause disruption. Recent IoT vulnerabilities have shown just how easily a bad actor can exploit these devices to deploy botnets and conduct surveillance. Market research tells us that the number of deployed IoT products surpassed traditional internet-connected devices in 2019 and that by 2025, the ratio will be around three to one. The last thing we want to do is shut off innovation or stop using new devices because of our concerns, but we can't ignore the threat to our security. So we have to come up with a new approach. The reality is that many IoT devices today can be difficult, if not impossible to patch. They're built on top of diverse communication technologies, and they're often powered using chips that lack the capacity to easily accommodate security functions. Absent meaningful action, we can expect these issues to worsen as time goes on. Thankfully, we're seeing industry and government come together to address these risks. In recent years, governments, companies, and civil society have proposed and implemented a range of IoT cybersecurity initiatives to meet this challenge, from introducing voluntary standards and best practices to mandating the use of cybersecurity certifications and labels. Here in the United States, for instance, the 2020 IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act was signed into law in December 2020. The law requires the National Institute of Standards and Technology to develop cybersecurity standards and guidelines for federal government procurement of IoT products. It seeks to strengthen the security of IoT products, leveraging, as I mentioned, the federal government's purchasing power, ensuring that any device sold to the U.S. government adheres to the latest and significant cybersecurity practices, thus raising the bar for security across the entire industry. President Biden's May 2021 executive order further built on the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act by asking NIST to develop baseline security standards and standardize product labels for Internet of Things devices. NIST published its recommended criteria for cybersecurity labeling for consumer Internet of Things products in February of this year. These criteria and the types of standardized labels they can help foster are poised to play a vital role in strengthening the security of IoT products. By providing consumers with the ability to compare and contrast IoT products based on their cybersecurity protections, labeling programs, much like procurement rules, can raise the level of security ecosystem-wide. To build on this progress, we hosted an event at the White House just yesterday to accelerate the development of a U.S. IoT security labeling program and secure product design. We brought together key governmental and private sector stakeholders for an exchange of views and experience on IoT security conformance, assessment, and product labeling. 
and we articulated a forward-looking work plan to achieve our vision. We're far from the first to do this. Cybersecurity labeling programs have been floated for years and have recently advanced in the EU, Australia, the UK, and elsewhere. Throughout our efforts, we've looked for inspiration from the, inno from the innovative model developed by Singapore, which today has become a world leader in IoT security labeling. A wide variety of industry associations are also developing their own IoT security labeling programs. This global attention to IoT security is an imperative for this moment in history, but it also carries risks if done without proper consideration of how we can harmonize these programs across borders. This is one of the reasons I'm so pleased to be here today addressing this exact issue. As we develop our program in the United States, we're doing so in close consultation with those who have gone before us, Singapore, the EU, and others. Not only can we all learn from each other, but we can also work to make sure we're not creating undue burden on industry or confusing consumers who might bring IoT devices from one jurisdiction to another. We must be careful not to fragment the global marketplace by placing distinct and overlapping requirements on industry. If industry must go through multiple redundant certification programs, we risk manufacturers doing less, not more. We want to avoid placing burden on consumers who will have to differentiate between various cybersecurity labeling schemes and understand what security functions each scheme provides. It's our common goal to prevent this type of fragmentation as we all make advances in this space. So we intend, we're looking at harmonizing standards across the globe and working towards mutual recognition of different jurisdictional labels. It should be straightforward for industry to meet the requirements of each jurisdiction and easy for consumers to understand what they're getting when they buy a product. That is the task before us. I look forward to working with Singapore and with all of our international partners to ensure that we're all working collectively to shore up our cybersecurity defenses. IoT devices will continue to transform our world, how we work and how we live. It's imperative that we foster that innovation while also keeping ourselves safe, and we absolutely can. The United States is eager to continue our work with a breadth of stakeholders and our international partners as we meet this moment in technological development. I hope you have a productive discussion on next steps, and I look forward to hearing about it. Thank you and be well. Thank you, Ms. Neuberger. Next, I would like to invite Ms. Lindy Cameron. She will be sharing with us on the same topic, but this time from a UK perspective. Ms. Cameron, please. Good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for inviting me to speak at Singapore International Cyber Week. It's fantastic to finally be here in person after a couple of years of only watching virtually. And it's really great to be in Singapore, one of the world's smartest cities. So I'm going to talk to you today about the Internet of Things and smart cities as connected places. Singapore and the UK have a shared vision of how we can improve the security of our nation's internet connected devices set out in our strategic partnership agreement signed in 2019. And our collaboration to drive improvements in the security of smart consumer products continues to this day, with Singapore and other nations represented here. The rapid spread of interconnected devices has also increased government and industry partnerships focused on ensuring that the benefits of a connected world are not overwhelmed by the abuse of that technology. And we in the UK, are really proud of the strong framework we've developed for managing the future security of the Internet of Things, including new legislation called the Product Security and Tele Telecommunications Infrastructure Bill, um, which I'll talk about shortly. But first, what do we mean by the Internet of Things and why on the earth does it matter? For us, it's about automation, connectivity and efficiency, leveraging these to improve our lives, boost our economies and free our time to be more productive. It's a huge opportunity. The sheer range and number of applications for these technologies is vast. From the control of a building's access systems and air conditioning to the monitoring of your sleeping baby, 
more infamously described by our former Prime Minister Boris Johnson at the UN General Assembly as a future with fridges beeping for cheese and mattresses which monitor your nightmares. But what's certain is that these connected devices, from smart homes to smart cities, are now part of our everyday lives. And in fact, in a study by global consultancy firm McKinsey, found that by 2025, consumer IoT could, contrib could contribute between 155 and 270 billion pounds a year to the global economy as a result of more efficient energy management, labor-saving automation, and the avoidance of injuries and fatalities through improved home security. And we think about the products and associated services that make up the Internet of Things on three different levels, consumer, enterprise, and city as, as quick shorthand. At the consumer level, IoT has exploded in scale over the last decade or so, with 8.4 billion devices or things connected to the Internet in 2017, but an estimated 75 billion by 2025. At an enterprise level, the story is very similar. The proliferation has been rapid and broad-based. Network printers, smart building management systems, and security products are being used to boost productivity and automate repetitive tasks. And at a city level, we see the growth of technology, as the minister described, to manage transport, waste, CCTV, street lights, traffic lights, parking, and public health services such as health and, health and social care or emergency services. But at every level, households, businesses, cities, and local governments are keen to reap the benefits of smart devices. They are obviously compelling. They form a range of critical functions and services to us all. And as I said, they're an opportunity, not just a threat. But the sheer scale of changes we're talking about and our growing dependence on technology also brings risks. That's why now's the time to make sure we're designing and building them properly. We all know that connected places are an evolving ecosystem comprising a range of systems that exchange, process, and store sensitive data, as well as controlling critical operational technology. And unfortunately, that makes these systems an attractive target for a range of threat actors, criminals, but also nation states, a threat we see as particularly acute. Some countries will seek to obtain sensitive commercial and personal data from other nations, including from us in the UK. These countries may also seek to influence a supplier or cause disruption to services overseas. Suppliers that are part of corporate groups based in these countries may be subject to influence from the host government to access and exfiltrate data from connected places in support of that government's security and intelligence services. And such suppliers may also be used as a vector for an attempt to take down essential systems overseas, causing possible destructive impacts and endangering local citizens if systems were switched off. So we in NCSC, the National Cyber Security Centre in the UK, have sought to lay bare these threats in the work we've done on how to secure connected places. We believe in an approach that builds resilience at scale, based on principles that allow states and citizens to encode the values that they want, building standards that let us get ahead of the problem rather than just responding to decades of legacy challenges later. So in the UK, for the Internet of Things, we started with a 13-point code of practice that we in the NCSC developed for the IoT industry in 2018 with the express goal of creating a more easily manageable cybersecurity picture for connected technology, what we call secure by default, influencing the design of the Internet of Things right from the start. And then in 2020, the UK shaped and then adopted a new Etsy standard on connected product security, EN 303645, for those of you who want to look it up. And finally, as I said, the UK Product Security and Telecommunications Infrastructure Bill, which is currently working its way through our parliament, is seeking to enshrine in law the secure by design principles. That bill places cybersecurity standards on manufacturers, importers, distributors of internet connectable devices, it was developed jointly by NCSC and by the UK Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport in collaboration with industry and welcomed by them as a proportionate approach. It ensures the security of connected devices on the market and it holds device manufacturers to account for upholding basic cybersecurity standards 
such as discontinuing default passwords and other blatant security shortcomings. I mean, password doesn't count as a password, nor does admin or 1235, as we find in our regular research. But it also asks manufacturers to maintain a vulnerability disclosure program and to explain how long devices will continue to receive security updates. I mean, none of these measures are revolutionary, right? None of them are indeed super technical. In fact, for a lot of the rest of the IT world, they're cybersecurity 101. But these guidelines, combined with the availability of new international IoT standards, means that legislation is now much simpler to put in place and for industry to follow. But if it's gonna have effect, as my colleagues have said, we need the commitment of government and manufacturers around the world to enforce these standards. And we believe that's foundational to the security of the future Internet of Things. Which is why we've not just focused on the UK. We've worked with others to take a similar approach that shapes the market for this tech. And I'm delighted to say that one of those countries was Singapore. Another area requiring government and business focus is a concerted effort to make technology harder to exploit in the first place. We need to secure our foundations by building resilient semiconductors. And the UK government is investing in this exactly via the Digital Security by Design program, developing pioneering UK academic research into real hardware that developers can actually use, tackling the buffer overflow problem that enables Heartbleed that's been with us since the dawn of computing. Technology and digital service providers need to work with government and academic partners to make connected systems more secure a source behind the scenes reducing the burden on end users. And again, it's fantastic to see the collaboration of this kind and hardware security between university here in Singapore and those in my home nation of Northern Ireland, which with a shameless pitch is where our flagship conference Cyber UK will be held on April 19th and 20th next year. And I know it's a place dear to the minister's heart as he studied there himself. So the internet of things at scale in connected places or smart cities, depending on your preference, is a clear example of how the Internet of Things technology can become a matter of national resilience. The possibilities for the improved standards of living we can experience, sustainability and growth are huge, but this potential gain must be balanced against the threat of compromise, which is equally immense, especially at this scale of deployment. And in recent years, we saw indications that local governments in the UK understood the opportunities of this, but didn't understand the risks. So in recognition of this trend, my organization has been working with government, academia, and international partners to agree cybersecurity principles for the technological developments around connected places. These principles are ultimately about the balance between security, safety, and functionality. So in May last year, following joint research with our Center for the Protection of National Infrastructure and Industry, we in the NCSC published a set of principles on our website. These connected places cybersecurity principles, believed to be the first in the world, outline how governments and organizations can securely design, manage, and build smart cities. And again, our approach is to get ahead of the problem. Our aim with these principles and our wider support for the sector is to help designers, vendors, and operators of connected places to make informed decisions about the high-level security requirements that should govern smart cities in a way that reflects their values, and to do so right from the design phase. So in this, I'm particularly grateful to Singapore's Smart Nations Digital Government Office, SNDGO, who are seeking to test these principles in the field, something they're able to do because Singapore is one of the leaders in putting this technology into practice. So collaboration, cooperation, and the ability to learn from each other's experiences while reflecting our own values and cultures in the use of technology, this will help to keep us safer and more secure. We will make more progress and produce longer lasting results if we do this together. So I encourage you to read these principles and think about how to apply them in your own context, build them further, and take them forward together. So to sum up, I'd reiterate my call for clear, workable international standards which shepherd technology towards a safer and more secure future so we can fully grasp the incredible advantages which these emerging technologies promise. Unless we design them properly, things like smart cities could bring with them ever-increasing attack surfaces, a proliferation of vulnerabilities for adversaries, both state and criminal, to exploit. Over time, done badly, this could stifle growth and eventually national prosperity. As indeed, though, as my colleagues have said, could overly heavy-handed regulation that stifles markets and prices the poor out of having a choice of technology at a reasonable cost. 
The stakes are really high. We must make sure that our devices are designed, built, deployed, and managed with security as a first-class concern, not added on as an afterthought. And we must also be certain that malicious actors cannot find ways to circumvent our defenses. This means being clear and tough about the requirements we place on those devices and the standards we apply when using them. There's no point in hoping this problem is going to go away. Without swift, decisive, and ongoing action, it will only get harder and more expensive, to be frank, to break nations of their dependence on insecure connected devices. So together, as my colleagues from the US and Singapore have said, we can create a world which benefits from the huge promise of connected technologies while protecting them from cyber threats. It's great to be here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much for that wonderful insight, Ms. Cameron. Ladies and gentlemen, there will now be an intermission for a coffee break and networking session. Please do help yourself to the refreshments available at the back of the studio. And don't forget to browse the products label on the CLS, along with the booths of the Evaluation Labs. Later on at 2.45, do also join us for the signing of the mutual recognition arrangement on cybersecurity labels between BSI Germany and CSA Singapore. They'll take place in this studio as well. I'll see you back here in 30 minutes. Internet-connected products by Singapore and Finland authorities will be mutually recognized in both countries. This comes after a deal was signed at the Singapore International Cyber Week. The Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore says this will reduce duplicated testing across countries and improve market access for manufacturers. Geraldine Yap with more. This Wi-Fi router is one of the first consumer products in Singapore to get the highest level 4 rating under the Cybersecurity Labeling Scheme, or CLS. The device is one of 13 ASUS Singapore Internet Connected devices to have at least basic cybersecurity features. Individuals may not know what products are safe to buy and also the difference between brands. By having the uh, highest level 4 certification, you know, consumers can be assured that ASUS routers has been tested and proven to be the most secure under the cybersecurity labeling scheme. And this also gives them more trust and confidence in our brand. And these certified products won't just be recognized in Singapore. Under a new deal, products with at least a level 3 rating under the CLS will also be recognized by Finland's cybersecurity label and vice versa. The deal is the first of its kind in the world and Singapore hopes to get more countries on board. Finland and Singapore are the first two countries in the world to develop our respective cybersecurity labels for IoT devices. And I'm glad that we have decided to pursue mutual recognition. Our schemes are not identical. However, we share the mutual interests in encouraging products to be embedded with better cybersecurity provisions and support the digital economy by reducing duplicated evaluations and the cost of compliance. Since it's launched last October, the CLS has attracted over 100 applications. To date, 40 products have been rated. The majority of IoT consumer devices are built and developed to optimize functionality and cost. And usually, this is at the expense of the security of the device. But we're increasingly realizing that IoT security cannot and should not be an afterthought. It needs to be a key consideration, a design fundamental. Without the requisite security in place, it leaves end users exposed to malicious cyber threat actors who seek to compromise the devices and this results in the loss of data, but more importantly, privacy and trust. He adds that authorities are looking to expand the scheme beyond consumer devices. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Taking place right now will be a panel discussion on the internationalization of IoT standards and certification framework.
Our moderator for this session is Mr. Peter Stevens, Directorate for Science, Technology and Innovation at OECD. And joining him for this panel, we have Ms. Grace Burkett, Director of Operations at IOXT, Mr. Tsui Baoqiu, Vice President and Chairman of Cybersecurity and Privacy Technical Committee. He will be joining us via Zoom for today. Mr. Tahata Shinya, Director for Policy Planning, Office of the Director General for Cybersecurity at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, as well as Mr. Lim Sunchia, Director of Cybersecurity Engineering Center at CSA Singapore. Can I invite all of our moderator and panelists up on stage, please? Okay, and now that we have all of you on stage, Mr. Stevens and panelists, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to, uh, to be here today in Singapore. Um, thank you so much uh, to representatives from CSA for inviting us. It's a real pleasure to be here um, and discuss this important topic. Thank you also to the previous um, speeches we had before to really set the scene and it's great to see uh, in the back of the auditorium, um, representatives from a variety of manufacturers and also labeling scheme designers to help um, bring this to life a bit more. So today we've got a great panel um, and we've got a great opportunity to listen in from perspectives uh, from a range of, of, of organizations and people um, because we do know that it's now six years since the Mirai attack and we remember the, the impact that it had. Um, and what we saw from the talk today was that there's a the, the IoT challenge is not getting any smaller. In fact, it's actually growing and it's growing very quickly. Um, we heard about uh, growth from 8.4 billion devices to 75 billion in 2025. Um, and we know that the consumer still is struggling to understand um, what security looks like and how they can buy the right product that, uh, that, could be, that can give them the protection that they want. Um, and as we also talked about, this is the beginning of a very important new stage where we see these devices being used in smart cities and enterprises. So the attack surface is just going to get bigger. And it's really, really important that we do try to, uh, to, to get this, this question moving quickly. So I'm really grateful for the panel we have today. Um, and I know this is, this is not just a technical problem, but a social problem. And it's a multi-stakeholder challenge. So I'm very grateful to have the panel here as well as Dr. Shui, who is joining us remotely as well. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to this, this conversation. I would also say, please do join in the Slido because we do want to make sure that we are capturing the perspectives from the audience as well. Um, so please do join in um, and share questions there. The format will be, we will have 10 minute presentations from each representative. And then after that, we will move into a question and answers format. So um, well, the first thing I would like to do is invite our esteemed co uh, colleague from the CSA, Dr. Um, uh, Sun Chi Liam, um, to, to, to talk to him about his perspective uh, from the CSA. Yeah, uh, thank you, um, uh, Peter. Well, um, well um, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this uh, leadership uh, dialogue. Uh, CSA has uh, launched the uh, world's first uh, multi-level uh, uh, cybersecurity scheme uh, since 2020. Uh, two years on, um, we are still very much a voluntary, uh, largely a voluntary scheme. Uh, two years on, we are still very much uh, largely a voluntary scheme, uh, main, mandatory, mandating only um, the critical device uh, such as uh, Wi-Fi routers uh, as, uh, uh, at uh, uh, CLS level one. Um, uh, and um, we are very encouraged, we are very encouraged by the developers um, who are actually embracing uh, this uh, 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 cybersecurity scheme 
uh, we are given that it has a low bar of entry um, at level one, but actually um, being a four-level construct allow uh, actually uh, developers to actually expire uh, for, uh, to, for higher assurance. So um, it actually um, allow them to um, come in at a low bar without stifling uh, innovation and yet nudge them uh, towards higher uh, assurance um, uh, uh, for cybersecurity. Um, I have to say that actually the whole scheme actually is very well adopted. Um, uh, two years on, we have more than 200 uh, label, uh, de uh, devices um, uh, um, uh, in the market, in the uh, online shops as well as the uh, physical stores. And uh, it's across um, various uh, uh, levels as well as uh, uh, the different uh, a spectrum of uh, cyber security, uh, 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 a spectrum of uh, device categories, uh, as you can see on the chart. And uh, this include uh, leading global brands uh, in, such as Google, Linksys, Asus, TP-Link Global, uh, Philips, uh, and uh, importantly, actually the industry actually recognizes that actually CLS uh, could actually gain uh, consumer confidence against potential uh, cybersecurity risk and, uh, and online harm. And I'm also very excited uh, to note that through the mutual recognitions uh, together with Finland, uh, we are seeing an enriched, we are seeing that um, the uh, cybersecurity, uh, uh, the, the IoT devices available in the market is being enriched and um, uh, widened uh, because of uh, devices uh, that, is, uh, that are labeled actually from both Singapore and uh, Finland being uh, uh, recognized on both sides. Uh, through CLS and its uh, agile uh, governance, um, we are also transforming uh, mindsets, both in terms of the industry as well as the consumer. In the industry towards a proactive and uh, sustainable industry, uh, and we are also getting consumer ready for, uh, for the digital, digital future. Maybe let me explain a, bit, a little bit more. Uh, at the onset, uh, we, uh, when we started with uh, uh, CLS, uh, we have wanted to make sure that uh, it depart from the uh, conventional compliance, uh, developer-centric compliance focus uh, methodology, um, uh, which actually largely based on uh, legislation, uh, legislation uh, which often is uh, too little too late. Uh, so with that uh, agile uh, governance modality, uh, what we have uh, actually witnessed uh, is uh, that um, uh, we are seeing that uh, consumers are demanding more secure product and actually that incentivizes industry actually to produce actually more, even more secure, uh, uh, to, to proactively um, uh, 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 develop more secure product. So we are having um, them actually very proactively and actually uh, because of the demand, it also uh, sustained actually the industry and, and, incent and incentivize the industry to produce more. Uh, at the same time, actually for consumers, um, we couldn't take for granted uh, that they would be uh, uh, cyber secure. Uh, they, uh, they, they have the same uh, mindset as in the physical field where, in, in, in the physical uh, uh, um, world whereby they are actually uh, very intuitive in terms of uh, physical security, uh, like when they go out of the house, they will actually lock the room, um, they will zip the wallets and all that. I mean, many of us are actually not digital natives. Uh, so uh, we really need to, to uh, help them uh, to uh, get themselves digital ready. And we see that uh, a labeling scheme will be able, uh, is actually facilitating, um, uh, enhancing their awareness uh, uh, through the transparency, uh, as well as immune in them a cybersecurity consciousness when they are purchasing product. And that uh, uh, transcend through and actually get them ready uh, 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 with a transformed mindset uh, for a digital future. Um, I'd like to go on to my last point that um, we have actually gotten very strong feedback from the 
um, uh, uh, industries about the, 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 the rules and their pain points, uh, three of which are uh, fragmentation of uh, uh, standards as uh, many uh, countries are focusing on cybersecurity and uh, uh, are having different schemes. Uh, two is about eradicating um, the, uh, the duplicated uh, testing across borders. And three is about the increase of uh, cost of compliance uh, as uh, they uh, try to uh, assess market um, uh, uh, globally. Um, uh, to address these uh, concerns, uh, we have mooted this idea of a UCLF, the Universal Cybersecurity Labeling Framework uh, for Consumer Devices that we have put up to ISO uh, to be developed as uh, uh, international standards. And this essentially uh, serves as a universal framework for countries to develop their scheme and benchmark against it. Uh, and it's agnostic to whether it is a binary or actually it is a uh, a multi-level uh, scheme. Essentially, it helps to harmonize and, integrated, uh, and integrate international standards and at the same time um, uh, improves uh, market access by eradicating duplicated testing across borders and actually reduce the cost of compliance. Uh, with that, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Sunchia. And I think it's... It's, it was fantastic to walk around just before this panel to speak to manufacturers who are, who are using the labeling scheme um, and how much it's had an impact for their, their sales and to help convey that important message to, to consumers. Um, and I think it's, it's also important to try and break down that, um, that understanding of, you know, for me, I think consumers assume that it's safe because it's for sale. And there's that question about how do we proportionately shake up consumers to say you need to be aware of a certain number of things and we need that information to cut through. And so I'm really grateful for, for Grace to be here from her organization, the IOXT, um, who are a US-based industry association, who are going to talk through a little bit more about the work that you've been doing with your partners um, and how you're helping to address this problem as well. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, yes, so also I wanted to thank the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore for inviting me. I'm very excited to also be involved and discuss this topic. Um, so as Peter introduced, my name is Grace Burkhard. I'm the Director of Operations for IOXT Alliance. Uh, for those who don't know, IOXT is a group of manufacturers, OEMs, lab, labs, global regulators, um, and many more who are dedicated to uh, establishing testable standards and harmonizing around best security practices. Um, our goal is to bring security, transparency, uh, and upgradability to the market and also into the hands of consumers directly. Now, today we're all here to address international standards fragmentation, obviously, uh, and we've heard a lot of suggestions and what everybody else is doing. So I'm here to capitalize on that and dive a little deeper into what IOXT is doing around that as well. So collaborate together, promote transparency, and support harmonization. Now, there are many public and private organizations who are creating standards today, and more and more are coming based on new threats that arrive. So it just becomes very tedious, though, and time consuming and expensive for manufacturers to obtain these uh, necessary certifications and do the research for it. I mean, when you start looking at it by country, by market, by industry, there's a lot out there. So what does it mean to collaborate, right? Well, let me just take a quick minute to go over some of those organizations that I just mentioned. In the US, you have NIST, FCC, FTC, GSA, PSA, Department of Commerce. Uh, in the UK, we heard DCMS and NCSC. In the EU, you have uh, Etsy, ANISA, ISO, uh, and the Red Directive, why we're here today, CSA. <laughs> Uh, and 
and Australia, ACSC, and the Department of Home Affairs. These are just a couple of the big organizations that are out there um, and that IOXT is working with specifically throughout the years. And so there, there's not enough time, honestly, to get through all of them. So again, this is just high level, right? <clears throat> so what does it mean to collaborate? How do you start collaborating? Well, probably first and foremost, and maybe the easiest, is to join a work group. So this means exchanging ideas and security best practices between organizations. I, we really want to maybe uh, incorporate existing standards into new profiles or even new standards that are still being made today. Overall, it's easier to use what's out there than to recreate the wheel. Next is commit to data sharing. So for too long, organizations have kept critical information in silos, limiting the global industry's ability to understand vulnerabilities and risks that we all face. Sharing data creates faster action to mitigate risk and ensure third-party validation and authentication uh, meets appropriate baseline requirements. Uh, next is to map standards. So a lot of us are doing this already, uh, but essentially every industry has you know, a couple baseline security requirements that most standards are following anyways. May not be 100% coverage or one-to-one -one equivalent. Um, however, most of them overlap a decent amount, which can aid in fast-pathing certification um, for manufacturers and their products, makes it much less tedious on them. And then at the highest level, you can co-recognize certifications. So we are already seeing this with CSA in Finland and Germany later. Um, we are working towards that as well on our own path with CSA. So many are starting to do this and you know, they deserve the kudos that they get for that because it is so important to help bridge the gap. Uh, overall, I believe working together is going to help us get ahead of attackers who are exploiting the weaknesses in our current fractured environment. So next is to promote transparency. We all know that third-party validation uh, provides peace of mind to organizations, partners, and consumers alike. However, not only that, but it can also boost the purchasing confidence. It provides or offers thorough validation um, testing and it can, it can broaden the testing capabilities. So the third party though, is not necessarily scalable all the time, right? Uh, it's very expensive. It may take a long time to actually do the testing. So another option is self-certification um, which is usually uh, uh, more affordable and easier to update and less time consuming. Now, whichever method, though, that you do, you should definitely have some checks and balances in place. This can be researcher rewards program, vulnerability disclosure program, bug bounty program, whatever you want to call it. Essentially, just make sure that it exists and that it is enacted. Uh, and then... How does this actually relate to transparency? Well, there should be communication to the consumers. So we're already starting to see this in today's industry, and we're actually starting to see some requirements um, towards transparency. You may have heard ask app not to track or accept all cookies versus manage preferences. Consumers are becoming more aware However, they're not quite there yet because I still hear today from too many manufacturers, oh, we will implement security when our consumers ask for it. However, when you go to the consumers and tell them that, they say, what are you talking about? Uh, I thought security was already built into the product. And lo and behold, it's not always the case. So if consumers only knew they would demand security every single time. And I think, you know, as IoT devices take on more critical roles in the industry, 
it's paramount for manufacturers to build in security from the start and then take responsibility to uh, maintain it and make sure that it is still being upheld. So how do you become transparent? Uh, you can either create your own label or adopt one that already exists. So there are clearly CLS that is out there um, and being adopted by many. The National Institute of Standards and Technology or NIST in the US is also creating yeah. um, a, a, in the process actually of creating it uh, their own. And so they're putting parameters in place for what this looks like. And so a couple options that we've heard, and just to you know, uh, deep dive into what Anne had mentioned earlier, one is a binary label. And so this is a single, simple, usable uh, label that shows conformity to a uh, simple baseline, such as the Energy Star label. Most people know what this is. If not, um, Energy Star is a US program that promotes the energy efficiency and provides information around the consumption of energy on devices. But the point being that when a consumer sees this label, they understand what it means. They don't need further information. It's great and very effective, um, a binary label, in the instance when consumers either lack the time or expertise or maybe even the desire to be provided with additional information. There's also a layered label, and so this is where a primary label leads the consumer to additional information online. Uh, this helps in aiding the education and providing um, more information to a wide range of consumers. Uh, and it also helps, again, what has been discussed before, uh, it may enable for comparison between labeling schemes. Biggest component overall, though, I would say, is to promote certification in general um, and also provide terminology that is easily digestible for the everyday consumer. So last but not least, support harmonization. This goes just a step further from the collaboration efforts that I mentioned before. This is be flexible. Right? The IoT environment is ever-changing due to new threats, vulnerabilities, new products. Um, so you want to make sure that you're always uh, moving forward and able to have standards that can both stand the test of time, but also flexible enough that they can adapt. So in case of any big threat that comes to the world. Next is to be aligned. So. Global leaders and technical experts should be aligned on the basic security practices um, for the greater good of everyday consumers. One option is for private organizations to take the lead on creating the standards, um, but in working with conjunction very closely with global regulators. Ideally, however, um, we'd like to have one global standard uh, that is created under one label. Next, be timely. Uh, standards should be updated on a regular basis. Uh, you never want standards to be old or stale or become obsolete. So this may mean that they need to be updated on an annual basis or maybe as needed, depending on the threat that arises. Overall, though, we should be working towards one global standard for IoT. We need to be aligned uh, not just to prevent attackers uh, from you know, taking advantage of untested IoT devices, but also to fuel innovation. Uh, when you have, without global synchronized security standards, uh, IoT doesn't have the runway it needs to evolve. So as we come together around harmonized IoT security guidelines, um, we will have better, better ability to mitigate risk, ensure transparency, and open the potential for future IoT.
So to recap, very quickly, again, collaborate together, promote transparency, and support harmonization. We've heard it multiple times. You're going to continue to hear it, um, and we're looking forward to further efforts around this. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Grace. Um, I think you made a really valid and interesting point. I liked your map and the, the range of three-letter abbreviations. It seems that I'm sure all of those letters would spell something if we put them together <laughs> of all of the organizations that are involved in, in this world. Um, so I, I think I liked your point about kind of how can we map what's already there. I think that like a, a lot of as scientific inquiry going well back, you know, would say it's important to stand on the shoulders of giants. You know, there's stuff that's already there. It's mostly pretty good. Let's try and make, take advantage of that. Um, and because we don't need to, as, you're, as you said, reinvent the wheel, um, we, we, can, we can do that. I think um, you made a really interesting point about the, the, the range of options of, for binary labels as to third party, to self-certification. There's, there's sort of where's the proportional approach for that. I thought it was interesting, you know, we were discussing, is it likely that in the future someone might say, I want to have a, cam a, a smart camera or a router, therefore I want it to have gone through third party assessment, but for my fridge, I'm, I care less. You know, that's the sort of decision making which, which a consumer is able to do. And I thought that was a really interesting point. Um, I think it's, it's also interesting about how we can bring in the, the, the one global standard approach, because of course, it's important to recognize that each country has its own sort of the consumers react to labels or information in particular ways. There's a cultural context and also there's a, in quite cases, existing legislative architecture that you need to be aware of and parliamentary sort of all those different things. But I, I think it's a really, it's a really valid point in that importance of that, that teamwork and fundamentally to making life easier for, for manufacturers. Cause my, my optimistic belief is that manufacturers all want to make secure products. They, they want to be shown that those products are secure. They want to be signposted that they are secure. And also if they make secure products to be recognized for that. So I, I'm so grateful um, to Dr. Sheed to, to joining us here from Xiaomi, and thank you so very much for joining us today. Um, so I'd love to, to pass the floor to you for you to give a presentation about the, the work that you're doing uh, in, in Xiaomi and, and how we can, we can all learn from your perspective as well. So can I pass over to you? Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks to uh, CSA for inviting me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Today, I'm going to uh, share with you about uh, the journey of Xiaomi IoT security and privacy, and how we build user trust through transparency. First, uh, let me give you a brief introduction about myself. Uh, my name is uh, Bao Chiu Cui. Uh, it's kind of hard to pronounce. I joined Xiaomi more than 10 years ago. Uh, I have been the chairman of Xiaomi Security and Privacy Committee for the last eight years. So uh, security and privacy is a hot topic to me. Most of you may have heard about uh, Xiaomi and may know a little bit uh, about what Xiaomi does. Uh, Xiaomi started with a smartphone company 20 year, uh, 12 years ago. Four years after its foundation, we decided to enter the IoT sector because we believe Xiaomi's business model can be copied from smartphones into other, many other products. Today, smartphone times AIoT is the core strategy of uh, Xiaomi. Our AIoT platform is a global leading consumer IoT platform. As of June 30th this year, there are more than 526 million devices connected on this platform. This number does not include smartphones or laptops. We care a lot of different numbers. First, I want to share the number of users with five or more Xiaomi IoT devices exceeded 10 million. And the MAU, a monthly active user, for uh, Xiao Ai, uh, our smart assistant, is 115 million. And the MAU for Mi Home app, the, the, the hub for all the IoT devices, is more than 70 million. All these numbers indicate that we have a huge 
IoT ecosystem. And as I said many years ago, the landscape of security and privacy is getting much larger. That's why we put so much effort on protecting data security and user privacy. This picture shows the long journey of Xiaomi security and privacy that we have gone through in the last 10 years. During this journey, a lot of things have happened. Here we can see some key milestones. Starting from the very beginning in 2012, we built the information security team from scratch. In 2014, when the company started to enter the global market, we established the Security and Privacy Committee. In 2016, Xiaomi became the number one, the first Chinese company to receive privacy uh, certification from Trust Act. And that time, Trust Act is still named Trust In 2018, we passed the GDPR compliance assessment down by a third party. And in 2020, we officially published the first version of our IoT security baseline. In Xiaomi's IoT ecosystem, there are more than 100 categories of IoT devices. Many of them are developed and manufactured by Xiaomi ecosystem partners. How to make sure that all of our ecosystem partners adhere to the same security and privacy principles and standards that Xiaomi follows is a huge challenge. When we started the IoT business back in 2014, we could not find any well-known IoT security standards and there was no cyber, uh, cyber security labeling. We had to come up with a set of rules or in-house standards for ourselves and for our ecosystem partners. In 2020, based on our experience and the best practices we accumulated in the last six years, we published the first version of cybersecurity baseline for consumer IoT devices and shared it with public, with not only with our partner, partners, but all the industry players. This was a great help in raising the overall cybersecurity hygiene level in Xiaomi's IoT ecosystem. When more and more IoT devices are developed and used or purchased by users, more and more users start to have concern about privacy in addition to security. This is really understandable because a lot of IoT devices, such as IP cameras, Bitband, and smart watches, etc., are closely related to users' personal data. In order to give our users more transparency, we published the first version of IoT privacy white paper in 2021. In 2022, we updated both the IoT security baseline and IoT privacy uh, white paper with a lot of more, a lot more uh, detailed information. Let's uh, take a look at the second version of the IoT security baseline. We added a lot of uh, new contents uh, based on new regulations and requirements and also incorporated some contents from international standards. Uh, these standards uh, are from Europe, uh, the US, and several other areas. In this new version, we covered uh, 13 domains and 77 checkpoints. The domains include um, hardware security, communication security, OS, and data security. This version of IoT security baseline includes a lot of detailed information. If you are interested, you can download a copy from our trust portal. 
Xiaomi's uh, IoT privacy white paper provides an overview of Xiaomi's uh, privacy rules and practices in IoT products, as well as information about what types of user data are collected, why they are collected, and how they are stored, processed, and safeguarded. We try our best to make things transparent to users and make sure that they have a peace of mind when using Xiaomi IoT products. Some very important products are listed here. Uh, you can take a look, uh, like uh, IP cameras, rotors, electric scooters, and we have a lot more. Some of our uh, important IoT products have received international security certifications from BSI, UL, and Germany too. For example, Xiaomi is an electric scooter 4 Pro. It is the very first scooter in the world that received UL's IoT security rating gold level certification. This certificate um, indicated that the security baseline we set up before is in line with today's international standards. Even though we have done a lot in the area of uh, security and privacy, new products and new software, new technology, may still introduce new possibilities for security and privacy bugs or holes. We follow the global security best practices and launched our security vulnerability reward program in 2014. This is our bug bounty program. And we encourage uh, security researchers and privacy researchers to help us find the bugs, all kinds of bugs. Later in 2019, we also started to work with HackerOne, a well-known bug bounty platform. Last year, we have more than 500 active researchers. They, con they contributed a lot to secure our IoT ecosystem. For IoT devices, a security patching and timely adversary is essential. And keeping the IoT devices up to date is also a best practice for our users. Our users could find Xiaomi's security patching policy and useful information on Xiaomi product security center. We believe that a responsible security disclosure program will help users make choices. And by doing so, we can also gain trust from our users. Looking into the future of IoT security, we are very optimistic. Working together, I mean, academia, research, uh, research institute, government agencies, and all industry leaders. By working together, we can build a very secure IoT ecosystem. As one of Xiaomi's slogan says, we always believe that something wonderful is about to happen. So this is uh, all I want to share with you today. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Tree. And um, I, I'm very grateful for that. That was a very optimistic end note, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I think it was fantastic for you to talk through the scale of the growth that you've been on um, in, the, in the most recent, most recent history, uh, and also to talk about the, the range of third-party approvals and assessments that you've also been working through. I also particularly am interested in vulnerability disclosure programs and the importance of patching, the importance of, of that part of the process to make sure that we need to change consumers to think about how by the time the product gets to them, um, it's not going to be 100% secure, but it's going to, the, the responsiveness and the ability of the manufacturer to, adjust, to a, a respond to patches is really important as well. So I, I thank you so much very much for that perspective. Um, I'd now like to pass over to Tahata Shinya, um, who's joining us from, from Japan, um, to talk a bit more about the, the role in, in policy and also for, from, an, from a country state. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, at first, I would like to thank you, uh, 
very much CSA Singapore for inviting me today. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Shinya Tahata, and uh, I'm in charge of international cybersecurity affairs in the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communications, Japan. Today, I'll talk about our measures for cybersecurity on IoT. At first, I'd like to share some current issues on cyber threats. As part of measures against COVID-19, digitalization is accelerating and dependence on cyberspace, including IoT, is increasing. increasing. As a result, cybersecurity threats and risks are increasing as well, and cyber attacks against IoT devices are increasing rapidly. From now, it is important to promote digital exchange with cybersecurity in mind to further accelerate digitalization and digital transformation. And for that, IoT security is important. Our ministry is currently promoting comprehensive policies to address various aspects of cybersecurity and is focusing on IoT security measures in particular. Today's my presentation is divided into three parts. First, I'll start with talking about the current situation of cyber attacks. Second, I'll talk about our regulatory measures, both voluntary and mandatory. And the third is the project for treating against the cyber attacks. So this slide shows the increase of suspicious packets, uh, which our national uh, research institute observed last year. Also, the number itself has decreased since 2020. The ratio of the number of cyber attacks on IoT devices, uh, such as web cameras and uh, routers, are still in the largest in 2021. And as you can see from the ratio of others increasing, the attack targets of ports seems to be getting more diverse. There are many IoT devices uh, that are owned by organizations and they tend to have variable data. So the range and the influence from attacks can become large. They also tend to have longer life cycles than other devices and are different to difficult, uh, sorry, difficult to monitor and manage. Next, let me briefly explain about our IoT security measures in Japan from this slide. There are technical standards for terminal facilities in Japan. All terminal facilities uh, which connect directly to the networks of telecommunication operators is required to meet the technical standards for terminal facilities as set under the Telecommunication Business Act. Taking the importance of IoT security measures into account, we amended the technical standards and add several security requirements, which were enforced in April 2020. As this slide shows, terminal facilities, which are directly connected to telecommunications network, must mainly have these functions. The first is access control via a remote control function. The second is features to encourage users to change their default password settings. The third is firmware update features. The IoT Acceleration Consortium published the IoT Security Guidelines version 1.0 in 2060. Uh, this guideline is related to the design and manufacture of IoT 
equipment and network connectivity and was published as the international standard ISO IEC 27400. So let me uh, explain about uh, another uh, topic and the CCDS. Uh, Connected Consumer Device Security Council is an industry academic collaboration council aiming to improve the security of IoT devices and services, mainly on consumer electronics, and they have established the security requirements for IoT devices and launched a private sector voluntary certification program in October 2019. CCDS certifies IoT devices and software. The devices are certified on three levels of CCDS symbols, ranging from level one to three, and the certified pro products are automatically covered by cyber insurances which provides the cost of the investigation in case an incident occurs. So from this slide, I talk a little about our technical measures. We have mainly two measures for sending alerts about malware infected IoT devices. Active observation by the notice project and uh, passive ob observation by the NICTA project. The first one is the notice project. This acts as a countermeasure against vulnerable IoT devices which are already deployed in the internet. This is an overview of the project. First, our research institute, NICT, scans all IoT devices in Japan, which have global IP addresses, and then it tries to log into these devices using weak ID and password settings, uh, such as uh, ID is admin and password is password, uh, something like that. If our research institute finds vulnerable IoT devices, then it provides information about them, including their IP addresses and uh, timestamps to the internet service providers. The internet service providers then identify the users of these devices and uh, contact them to request they change their password. We have a notice support center to help users address vulnerability in IoT devices. So, uh, besides the notice project, uh, we also have the NICTA alert project. As I explained in the first slide, NICTA is an observing system for the darknet and it can detect malicious packets. It means that NICTA can identify the IoT devices uh, which are already infected with malware. When our NICT identify a device which is sending packets to the darknet, information including the IP addresses and the timestamps of the devices are sent to the uh, internet service providers and uh, ISPs then identify the users and uh, send an alert to them. We also have a support center uh, to give users some guidance on appropriate security measures. This slide shows the project's progress in this uh, August. There are about 200 million IP addresses in Japan, and uh, these projects, we conduct a survey on about 112 million IP addresses, which are managed 
uh, by 73 internet service providers that are cooperating with the project. On the left, you can see the routers of the notice project. The number of IoT devices which had weak password settings and uh, which could be logged into was around 4,400. They were subject to user alerts. As I said before, we have regulatory measures to set on terminal facilities, including IoT, and uh, these facilities are required to have uh, functions to strengthen security, including a requirement for a feature to encourage users to change default IDs and uh, passwords. But, but as you can see from the recent results, the number of IP addresses which were successfully logged into weak, with weak password setting is still very large. And also, we can't simply compare because we have seen adding factors to be surveyed. The number seems to be on a steady pace. On the right, as the result of the identification of malware infected devices observed by NICTA, the number of devices of which seems to be infected with malware and subject to user alerts were around 1,600 per day. So uh, this marks the end of my presentation. As you saw and heard, our ministry and Japan is contributing IoT security, and we would like to do both more and better with international cooperation and collaboration in the future. Thank you very much for attention. Thank you very much for that presentation, yeah. Tita. That was fantastic and a really interesting perspective to, to get. I was terrified by some of the numbers you were showing about um, 89,000 devices, 189,000 devices yeah. that had been found. Um, but the notice of NICTA projects is a really amazing way to gather that information about the scale of the problem, um, particularly in light of Mirai, and we've heard about the scale of the growth. So, so, so interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and also, I'm curious about how you work with the consumer when they, when they get notified they have found a problem, they get notified of that. And I think we need to remember that those, for now, if for these devices, those are the consumers. Those are the people who, who buy the product. Those are the people who are making the decision to bring something into their home, and in some cases, without necessarily knowing the risk that that could bring. And I think that, <clears throat> as was mentioned, of course, that has scale up challenges in, for smart cities and things like that. But if we focus on the consumer for now, I'd be really interested to understanding the, the Singaporean in more detail. So I'd be asking um, what your perspective is about how Singaporean consumers have been engaging with security and, and how that's changed in light of the labeling scheme. So Lintua, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, overall, over the last few years, I mean, with the more, um, with the higher awareness of uh, cybersecurity in incidents, um, I, mean, I mean, you can see it almost uh, every day on the newspaper, uh, there's um, uh, in enhanced uh, awareness uh, for the consumers um, of such risk um, and, uh, of course, um, uh, the need uh, to protect themselves. Um, and let me share uh, two uh, anecdotal uh, evidence. Um, prior to um, launching the uh, um, cybersecurity labeling scheme for IoT, actually we did um, a, a brief survey uh, to the attitude of uh, a consumer uh, towards uh, such a labeling scheme. And generally, it's very positive. Um, they welcome and embrace a labeling scheme. And importantly, uh, they are willing actually to pay more uh, for um, a more secure product. Um, interestingly, that is also mirrored in a similar survey uh, conducted by UK uh, DCMS, um, which so showed a similar uh, percentage, generally about more than 60% are willing to pay a little bit more. 
We are also very encouraged uh, during the launch uh, of our cybersecurity uh, labeling scheme. Uh, shortly after, we are hearing feedback uh, from the developers that actually they are receiving 30% uh, more inquiries you know, about their product and of course the labeling scheme as well. And uh, moving forward, um, now that uh, in Singapore we have more than 200 uh, labeled products in the market, we really want to intensify uh, our engagement with the, uh, with the consumers uh, to, help us, to help them to better understand the cybersecurity risk uh, and uh, actually to immune in them this cybersecurity consciousness um, uh, when they purchase product. Sure, thank you very much. Um, and I think it's interesting about the, the consumer and then thinking about how manufacturers can also engage with with, with labeling schemes, with other options. And so, um, Dr. Chuyi, I'd be very interested in your views of, you talked a bit, a lot about the, the range of third-party assurance schemes that you've been working with over the last 10 years. Um, what have been the main challenges um, to ensure that all of your products adhere to those minimum security standards? Uh, thanks for this question. Um, this is a very large question. Um, we do have a lot of uh, challenges, uh, especially in the early, early days or early years. Um, I just want to mention a couple here. The very first challenge is related to the fragmentation of IoT. Um, I just said that we have more than 100 different categories of IoT products, uh, from a vacuum cleaner to electric scooter, from a smart speaker to IP camera. Each product has its own special features and may, may have some unique uh, requirements from a uh, security or uh, privacy pr uh, perspective. So uh, also there are, now we have more than 500 million of devices connected on our IoT platform. Just think about that. How to uh, make sure that all these products are secure and how to deal with potential security issues for all these products uh, at the same time, and how to resolve security problems quickly uh, has been a huge challenge. It's very difficult for us. So we have to learn and dive deep into all kinds of technologies and learn from failures. So we have to put a, a lot of very strict uh, processes in, in your product design and development. So this is a, a, the very first uh, challenge. The second challenge is how to make sure that all of our uh, partners and the ecosystem partners share the same vision with us, share the same value proposition, share the same principles we follow for security and privacy. We adhere to the principles like uh, security by design, privacy by design. Can our partners do the same thing? Do they have the awareness, knowledge, uh, technologies, and tools to help them build secure products? We have no total control over this. We have a vision. We want to make friends with our users, and we want to be the, the coolest uh, company. We have to gain the trust of our users through transparency. Can our partners share the same vision, share the same view? The third challenge is um, how to find a set of common requirements, the baseline. Early, in the early days, we couldn't find any good, good standard. So we have to come up with our own. The process itself was not easy. It's a challenge. How can we put all the different technologies, uh, different designs together to satisfy all the products needs from different categories? So we have to think about, we have to have uh, all, kinds of, all kinds of innovation from technical to uh, product. For example, we have to uh, write, uh, it's better for us to use one mobile app. We call it Mi Home app on the mobile phone to synchronize all the services of all the different IoT devices. And also we, we use open source 
authors a real-time operating systems to unify the firmware on different uh, products. Mm -hmm. So by unifying, unifying the OS, the apps, the communication tools, and the testing tools, we can not only reduce the cost for compliance, but also increase the security of our products, reduce the possibilities of, of having um, security holes or privacy holes because of uh, the fragmentation. So um, these are the several challenges we, uh, we, we had in the past, and I believe we have more uh, in, in, the coming, uh, in the coming days, but still we are optimistic. And I just want to share this uh, with, with you today. Thank you very much, and I definitely, I'm, I'm once again grateful for the optimism, and, and I think it's, uh, it, it, you make a really valid point about the breadth of your product, the breadth, you know, as you say, vacuum cleaners to e-scooters, e and from a policy perspective, that's also different because you have existing legislation for scooters and vacuum cleaners, and now they connect to the internet, and so you have to think in a different way about those two things, building on what you already have. Um, I also thought about the role of supply chains is really important. How can you trust and have transparency with your, uh, the partners you work with um, from, from start to, to end product? So I think that is super interesting, and thank you very much for sharing that. I, um, and thank you for those who are sharing questions in Slido. Um, please do add more. Um, I can see we're getting some through now. Um, so I'd love to, to pass over to, to, to Hatta and understand a bit more about the notice project uh, and the NICTA project, and particularly understanding a couple of the key insights that you've learned from that exercise. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so the, we, we have learned uh, some things, and the number of cyber attacks observed NICTA has increased by 2.4 times in the uh, duration of three years up to 2021. This number shows that the IP addresses uh, that you are using is uh, all, also receiving packets that may potentially uh, be a cyber attack once every 18 seconds. Uh, while the target of these cyber attacks is diversifying year by year. Attacks targeting IoT devices such as web cameras and routers are still the most common. And IoT security measures are increasingly uh, important. And in addition, there are still many vulnerable devices on the network in Japan. Since we see such devices being infected with malware, and become a stepping stone to attack system in a form of DDoS attacks. There is a need to urgently implement countermeasures. The users of these devices may forget to set up security settings, or they may forget that such devices ever uh, existed in the first place. So the users need to be properly notified. And there are also cases uh, where devices uh, remain connected to the networks, but their support period had already expired. So it is necessary to, yeah, for the vendors of the IoT devices to properly inform their users of information on these devices and the measures that they need to take. Thank you. I, I, think, um, I think that makes a lot, a lot of sense. I definitely agree. I think, um, so I think the question still asked, Grace, is, is why do you think that there are so many who still don't adhere to even the most basic requirements? Why are we still in 2022 seeing default passwords? You know, I think there's several reasons for that um, and what we've seen from some manufacturers. So one of them is that 
they may be new to the environment, right? And so they might not have the necessary resources or budgets that they need to incorporate security because security can be expensive. Um, another one is that there are new devices that were dumb and are now becoming smart. So you might have, say, a fish tank thermostat that becomes smart. And why would I ever need to incorporate security into that? However, we did see in North America that a casino actually had their network hacked through the fish tank thermostat. <laughs> so it makes you wonder, hmm, probably everything needs to be uh, secured, right? Um, but then also, it, security, like I said, is expensive, and manufacturers are hesitant to pass on that um, price point to their consumers, because consumers are always thinking about pricing. And so if you have a $20 smart light bulb versus an $80 smart light bulb, which one are they going to choose? usually the cheaper one. So, however though, I think that there needs to be more consumer awareness and education around this because they don't necessarily think that it will happen to them or they don't think it will happen at all. Um, and so they need to understand what the vulnerabilities are out there and how it can impact them. No, I think that's very much right. I think you, the Fish Tank Casino is, is a great example. If anyone wants to motivate a stakeholder to care about IoT security, it's a very interesting case of uh, a seemingly innocuous device can have very devastating consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think your point about consumer awareness is really interesting because f from my experience, it seems that consumers sort of fluctuate in between both camps of, I'm gonna be fine, this doesn't happen to me, a secure products are always secure, they wouldn't sell me a secure a product if it wasn't secure. And then something happens in the real world, like a fish tank in the casino, and that kind of gets in the press. And then all of a sudden, the, the sort of consumer awareness swings into, oh my lord, this is a complete disaster. I can't connect anything to the internet, um, and I shouldn't invest in these products, which, as we heard, has like really devastating consequences because these products do ha are going to help us be more more connected, a bit more efficient, and also with a lower carbon footprint. So I think you know it's important that we we don't sort of have this constant pendulum swing but actually focusing on those issues that matter. And this is why I think it's really great that we have labeling schemes and it's a chance to help break through that consumer, that consumer like, unawareness um, of not knowing what to look for. So I really would love to just open now to, to questions of, to, from, from you all about your understanding of, of a label and about what your, why it's a great thing, but also maybe some of the concerns with a label as well. Um, so does anyone want to, to start and uh, I can take, I'll pick on someone. Yeah, I can start. Um, because I talked about the labels in my own presentation. And yeah, I think it's important to have, like I said, terminology that the everyday consumer can understand. And I think that's what we're struggling with right now when it comes to labels is because one, what does this label mean? And two, whose label is it, right? There are so many certifications out there and there's so many labels. Which ones should I be paying attention to? Which ones matter? Um, which ones are going to get me the right security that I need for me personally. And so I think, again, you should have multiple versions of labels, as I mentioned, you know, binary, where if there's already one out there that everybody recognizes, or hopefully we get to uh, one universal label that everybody recognizes, um, that's great. But at the start, you're going to have to have probably a layered approach where they can go get further information. Um, and again, the information should be in plain language, um, but enough language that they understand it as well. And just providing the extra information will go a long way. Thank you. Any, any, yeah, any? I think um, looking um, at uh, the implement, I mean, given the, the, the focus on uh, IoT and the cybersecurity risk, we are seeing that uh, many nations uh, are focusing on uh, implementing and operationalizing um, labeling scheme and all that. And Dr. Uh, uh, Chui have uh, mentioned that actually they are labeled in uh, three different schemes and all that. Um, and uh, I think really the challenge is uh, the challenge is really how to uh, harmonize uh, that requirement uh, and uh, uh, um, how to actually uh, mutually recognize uh, this uh, uh, label. Um, otherwise, we will have concern about standards fragment fragmentization. There will be too many of these uh, to contend towards. 
Um, so I think it is really, and, and, and many nations really have their own uh, preference, their own considerations in terms of having uh, a binary, uh, uh, um, binary uh, labels, perhaps, uh, perhaps easier for, 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 uh, to, to set a certain baseline. Um, um, other nations would want more comprehensive uh, requirement right from the start. Uh, for example, adherence to the full uh, requirements of EN 303, uh, 645, or other nations may just want to set a kind of a baseline. Uh, so, I mean, this is really one of the challenges of uh, having a, a, a labeling scheme. Uh, and hence, we think that, uh, well, we could, I mean, just like what Grace mentioned early on, I think it is important we come together actually to collaborate, harmonize and integrate uh, some of these requirements. Um, whether it's the EN 303645 or the US needs uh, requirement, uh, and then to, uh, see how we can better benchmark and actually map out uh, these requirements uh, so that we can achieve uh, some uh, level of actually uh, mutual recognition, not just on a bilateral basis, but more globally, uh, to make that whole uh, process of compatibility and mutual recognition actually a lot more uh, uh, efficient. Great, thank you very much. And I think there's another question that comes up about labeling of, we're starting to see, as we heard about sort of different forms of legislation coming in as well. So we saw in the US, there's use, the use of the federal procurement lever to try and sort of create the right incentives for industry. Um, the UK with the product security telco infrastructure bill, um, the EU with the cyber resilience act, we've got voluntary and then voluntary approaches as well. When do we, so the question for me is about, you know, in so voluntary versus legislation and, and sort of proportionality and innovation and, uh, and security. What do we think about this sort of, is, is an entirely voluntary approach enough? And what do we think it would take to think, okay, we need to move into a legislation and a hard levers point? Um, that or, or anyone? Yeah, so. Mm. Oh, yep. so, so yeah, um, perhaps I'll go first. I mean, since we actually have a largely uh, voluntary scheme, I think our preference is uh, still a vo uh, voluntary scheme, actually to let the water find its level. And I think Grace mentioned earlier on, um, or was it Peter, that uh, actually different products um, may um, uh, require a different level of uh, security. You know, maybe uh, lights may require less uh, assurance level, maybe uh, the, the Wi-Fi router, I mean, being critical in the infrastructure may require a, a higher level of uh, security. Um, so um, we really want to um, have a very uh, flexible scheme and actually a voluntary one. But um, to a large extent, uh, we think uh, it is not sufficient as well. Um, we need a little bit of nudging. So right from the start, uh, um, uh, in our experience, actually we work with um, um, the regulator, in this case the telecom regulator, uh, actually to uh, set a baseline for um, critical, uh, uh, for, for Wi-Fi routers. Um, the interesting thing is that actually we, sit, we set it just at level one. Uh, but um, we can see that uh, there are certain companies that are not sat satisfied with just setting at the baselines of level one. I mean, because of company branding and all that, I mean, they really wanted to make sure that they have the most secure uh, Wi-Fi router out there too. So they actually uh, straight away go for uh, level four. And I think this is a very good uh, market dynamism uh, because there has also spill uh, spillover effect uh, to the telco sector. Um, what do I mean? I mean, in Singapore, we have subscription for, I mean, uh, say, uh, a broadband service. And when you, do, when you subscribe to one, actually, you get a free uh, a, a, a Wi-Fi router. I, so now the actually telco company actually have to think a little bit um, harder to see whether they are actually uh, the baseline, uh, provide baseline requirement, uh, baseline assurance or actually higher assurance. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so I think th there's, there's another thing that's been coming through a lot is the importance of feedback and the importance of vulnerability management. So how can we make sure that we have that approach for manufacturers to, to say, if you find a patch, if you find a problem in our product vulnerability, please do tell us and we can, we can patch that. And that's a, an important part of making sure your product is as secure as it can be. And so I, I know that in the UK, we do regular studies to assess the proportion of manufacturers that are adopting 
a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program that aligns with 29147. And I know that skill, still the number is, is about 20% do, 80% don't. And that's, that's pretty scary, really, because it's, it's grown a bit, but still there's a, lot of, there's a lot of opportunity to go after there. And for me, I think this, this is a really important, important thing to do, because if you think about, you know, for me, I always think about aviation, right? Aviation is so safe and secure because of the black box and because we have that feedback whenever something happens to learn from that. And, and I think it's the work, the work of vulnerability research is to, to say, we found this problem in your product, please do fix it. And I think this comes back to the work that you were talking about, Sahata, in, in Japan, about helping to, to show that feedback without there being a, a victim, I suppose, in that regard. So I think the question that I'm asking is, what can we do more to promote the necessity of penetration testing and the openness to vulnerability management within the IoT, do we think? Open, sir. Uh, MG award. Maybe I can contribute sure. a little bit. Thank you. Yes, please, Dr. Tree. Okay, thank you. Uh, I can share two uh, points. Uh, number one, I, I think we uh, each company um, needs to have a security uh, response center or security center to use a cross source to collect all the feedbacks, not only from users, but also from security or privacy researchers. So uh, SRC is uh, always needed for a responsible company. Um, so we make this uh, more transparent by doing so. And also we can work with uh, HackerOne, uh, this kind of uh, bug bounty platform or program to get more contributions from the security or privacy community. So this, uh, this is similar to open source model. And normally open source software is secure because we have many eyes are watching the code, each line of the code. So this is a um, one experience uh, we had. Um, another one is, um, I think, we have to follow all the regulations and requirements to um, disclose, disclose the security holes as soon as possible and try to fix that um, as soon as possible. Um, by doing so, uh, we, we, we make sure our users have a peace of mind. Um, but different um, regulations have different requirements. And th I think we have to do this piece by piece, but we have to have this uh, capability um, from tools to products to uh, technology. And in order to do this quickly, I strongly recommend every company, IoT company, should have uh, its own security professional teams, uh, uh, members, uh, other, otherwise, uh, rely on third party, uh, rely on uh, other platforms, is not uh, good enough. Uh, not good enough. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This, uh, this are problem that uh, we are actually grappling with as well, and how to make sure that the testing is more cost effective and actually move up the assurance and do more pen testing, for example. And this is exactly where I think Dr. Chui, uh, Dr. Chui, uh, mentioned earlier on that, I mean, there's so many uh, IoT products out there. Uh, yeah. um, so um, uh, what um, we have uh, seeded is actually a CLS-ready program, you know, whereby actually components uh, can be tested and such components, once tested, uh, which are reused in other applications, need not be actually uh, re-evaluated uh, re again. So it's on the con in the context of um, a composite uh, uh, evaluation. So that it makes it cost-effective um, for, uh, um, for companies uh, to actually do security by design upfront by making use of uh, critical, com critical components. And because these critical components are evaluated upfront, actually they don't have actually to evaluate again. Um, and as to vulnerability management, uh, I, I really um, uh, uh, 
really uh, appreciate the wisdom of the uh, 13 COP that the uh, UK came up with and actually eventually we signed a, a joint statement uh, on the first three baseline requirements, one of which is actually about uh, the uh, having a channel to do um, open uh, vulnerability disclosure. Mm. Uh, I thought actually that changed the entire mindset of the industry uh, because previously the industry is largely, oh, I mean, when I design a system, I push it out, I market, that's it, you know. But now they realize that there's a need to actually do continuous maintenance. Um, manage the, uh, manage the uh, vulnerability response to uh, such report and then uh, actually have um, uh, 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 um, uh, fix, a software fix, a software patch uh, in a timely uh, uh, basis. Great, thank you. I think that's a really important point about how do you make, like to, to Dr. Shree's point about um, bringing security within the organization to say actually you need to have a team here, but you, in, you can't be wholly reliant on the people and just to understand the language more, we've talked a lot this week about the importance of languages and the importance of policy and economics and security sort of talk, talking to one another. And I think that's an operational question, but still a really valid one. I think that's important for manufacturers to, take, to think, of, think about. Um, I think I'd like to, to also talk a bit a little bit about end of life and around minimum support for products, um, because I know that we're, it's it's something which is gaining traction in the legislative landscape. So in the UK, when we published the code of practice, we decided to kind of consult on where would be the proportionate starting point for legislative base that baselines. And it really came down to no default passwords, mandating the use of a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program, and uh, transparency at the point of sale about the length of time for which that product will be supported by security updates. And the, the idea behind that was saying, well, you know, we don't know how long you want to use your smart X product for, but you do because you're about to buy it. So you have an idea in your head if it's going to be a six month project or a five year project. And I think that, that that for me was interesting. I think that felt proportionate, but I know that there's also approaches which are saying, well, actually, it doesn't matter what it is. It must be at least five years and then maybe go more than that. And I think there's a question about how do you incentivize the adoption and also, how do you, um, how can we make sure that, pe that people are buying the product that is right for them, but also manufacturers are supporting them for as long as they can? So it's, it's a sort of open question, really, about how we feel about that distinction, um, because, you know, mandating periods or transparency or, and also just more broadly, you know, how can we sort of, how can we encourage consumers to care about that? Because right now they, they don't, I think, and that's my concern. So I'd love to hear your perspectives on that. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, so I think this goes back to a little bit of the consumer education as well, right? I think if you talk to them and ask them, oh, how long do you think this product will be supported? They'll say forever, right? And not necessarily the case. But unfortunately, I think it's also product dependent um, because not uh, every product is made the same, um, it has different security layers, uh, it's got different vulnerabilities, and so, and different uses, right? So you may need a light bulb and you don't want to think about that light bulb for 10 years, but you may have a cell phone and you're going to switch those out every couple years. Um, so I think overall, you're, it's not an easy question to have just one answer for. Mm -hmm. Um, but I do think it's important for consumers to understand how long it will be supported so that they can understand, oh, in this amount of time, do I get a new one? Do I start looking elsewhere? Uh, and there's going to be more vulnerabilities that come up as we go. So I know this will change throughout yep. time as well. Yep. Um, but hopefully we can start moving in that direction. And as long as they are aware, then they ha can go around that a little bit. Yeah. Thank you, and I think it's really interesting in, in Japan with the, 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 the various projects going on, Notice and Nikta, about yeah. informing consumers, because that's part of the problem as well, and how do you get them to, to think about that? So I think that's, it's really important work that you're taking on, on that front. Um, oh. Oh. So I, I think I, you know, something that I, I appreciate, we're, we're running quite low on time, um, and I am quite keen to, to also add a few questions as well, um, but something that's come through about the sort of we talked about earlier today from our panelists about the fragmentation of standards. You know, we have all of these different projects, many of which have got sort of three or four letter abbreviations, <laughs> all of whom are doing sort of various work in this space. And I think you made a really valid point, Grace, about, about mapping and about actually, yeah, of course there's gray area. And of course there is some, you know, some things which are applicable just in this context or just in that context. 
But broadly, there's a lot of similarity. There's a lot of consensus. Um, standards are designed to be kind of a wholehearted approach of, of everything there. But 80% of you know, 27402 and 303645, there's basically alignment there. The things kind of align. Um, and so there's a question about, you know, if we want to make progressive steps in light of the context of these devices being adopted more broadly in businesses and smart cities, how do we, you know, how can we focus more on that consensus? How can we really bring that to life? Um, and how can we sort of amplify that consensus, I think is a question I'd really love to, to dig into. Anyone? Yeah, yeah I can speak more on it. Um, sorry, did you? Yeah, you can go first. Um, yeah, so I think, again, this kind of goes back to a lot of the collaboration points. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. It might be several years, but there's definitely a point where you need to get to where you're talking to others and not just keeping everything in under one house um, because that's not going to get you anywhere. So I definitely commend you know, CSA and Finland and Germany. They're working together to recognize and map and uh, it's, gonna start, it's gonna help bridge that gap. Uh, the consensus part is, you know, does there, what are the base security requirements, right? Like get back to the roots um, because there's going to be, again, different security for different products, different industries. So you can build on top of those, but have that baseline that you're always coming back to and able to build on that foundation. i just like to mention that um, everyone should recognize that uh, um, the, the, the concern, the cybersecurity uh, risk concern actually is real and uh, everybody shared that. And I think everyone should recognize that all roads lead to Rome, right? Uh, but right at the moment is that everybody is taking different path towards Rome, <laughs> right? Um, I think so with that, uh, and, and actually you look at uh, many of the standards and requirements, actually the, the differences are only at that margin, especially uh, with respect to consumer IoT. Uh, so actually there's, um, there's great potential for us to come together, actually to harmonize and integrate these uh, uh, standards. Um, and that's, I think, what uh, we, are, we were hoping to actually uh, gov governize global efforts uh, toward. Um, and, and once you, I mean, that would be a good basis for us to be able to benchmark and map uh, the various schemes and all that and uh, towards more uh, universal and global uh, uh, recognition. And then hence, I call upon all like-minded partners to come along with us actually uh, to co-develop this uh, ISO 27404, the universal cybersecurity labeling uh, framework um, uh, and, and make it a reality. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I think just, I, I, we've got about 10 minutes left and I'm keen to think about, you know, it's, it's six years since Mirai and in a talk earlier this week, some, one of the panel members said that uh, the next five years will make the, le the last five years look easy. And I, I appreciate that, you know, from a kind of attack surface perspective, it's, it's just growing year on year. We keep seeing it's growing. Um, I think, but we are also seeing a sort of gathering momentum of sort of, to, to some, need, um, some cheers point about bringing together of existing frameworks, existing approaches, starting to see consensus also gathering and momentum building. Um, so, I hope there's an optimistic standpoint from, um, from the video call, but also just the, um, how do we see security progressing in the next five years within the IoT? And I think sort of both in terms of the optimist and also the, 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 the not so optimistic side of things. Um, anyone else trying to say that? Oh, no. Sure. Um, I'm actually really uh, optimistic. I think um, there's a lot more conversation, uh, just like this one in uh, I IoT Security Roundtable. Um, uh, not just uh, in small community, but is gaining momentum um, 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 across the world, uh, um, helped by also organizations like uh, where uh, Peter's come from, OECD and all that. So I think it's good. I mean, we are having a conversations and, and I think I'm really optimistic that with this conversation, more awareness that we are, uh, that there's great benefit to actually harmonize and integrate all these standards. I think uh, I'm really hopeful that in five year time, we will see a more, um, we will see less fragmentation in terms of standards and requirement. Uh, we will see uh, that in the industry, uh, we could, re we could eradicate, uh, eradicate uh, 
um, uh, duplicated testing across the uh, borders and uh, we will be able to reduce the cost of compliance for the industries uh, so that um, there's uh, greater market access for all and we can grow a digital economy together. Thank you. Yeah, to add on top of that, um, I'm also very optimistic uh, with a healthy dose of skepticism, um, as always. <laughs> but uh, I believe, you know, to, to build off of that, uh, we are moving in the right direction. We are having conversations. More people want to be involved in those conversations. It's not, you know, hey, please talk to me about this. This is important. Everybody is involved, right? Um, but there's also, you know, what are the right standards? What are those baselines? Like, how do we agree? You know, again, going back to the foundations, you're looking at you know, universal passwords. That seems pretty obvious. Um, but what are the other obvious standards? What might be obvious to you might be different for me, right? Um, so again, I don't know if it's going to be necessarily solved, but I think we're moving towards the right direction. And I think it's important to continue to look at and collaborate together so that we can um, make sure that we're still all on the same page um, and finding the healthy, healthy balance between all of us. No, thank you. I think, I think that's a really interesting point about um, he talks about not letting perfect be the enemy of the good. And the idea of, yes, like, as in we'll, we'll never be able to make all the products ranging from vacuum cleaners to e-scooters to anything else, that w never make them 100% secure from every form of attack. You know, it's a very, very fast paced. It's, it's, it's something which we, there's an assessment of risk that people need to be comfortable with. But I think that, you know, there is, you know, default passwords, you know, why are they still here? Like, there are things that we can do quite quickly to say, well, actually, those, those shouldn't be around anymore. And we know, like, California SB327 brought that through in 2020, I think. And then we've brought that into the PSTI bill as well in the UK. You know, there is that approach which we are, um, I think, keen to amplify them at that more to try and see if we can, we can bring that, you know, what's the proportionate step we can keep making? Because, like, I think also, sadly, um, we'll never fix, we'll never be able to say, great, we've solved, we've solved that problem, we can move on to something else, because I think this problem's always going to be here. Um, but we can, we can still keep progressing and making some steps there. Um, sorry, Cynthia. Yeah, and another reason for my optimism is that um, uh, when, we, when we started the labeling scheme, we wanted it to be short and all that. Um, but I have to say that uh, in, in the initial uh, few months, uh, it has been uh, an adios journey. Um, uh, we, we started off with a 10-day scheme, but uh, I mean, you can guess how long we took for the first few products uh, to be uh, labelled. It is almost six months, right? I mean, there's a learning process. I mean, the, the, the developers are willing, but there's a learning process uh, for them to understand uh, the, uh, the requirements, uh, the cybersecurity uh, requirements, and sometimes they actually need to do some engineering uh, uh, rework uh, to, to that process. In fact, I think a recent uh, uh, DCMS uh, a survey pointed towards actually, uh, I think in fact many of the developers would have uh, problems even meeting that uh, three baseline requirement. Mm. Um, but I have to say that, uh, that uh, despite the earlier uh, uh, obstacles, um, actually those who have, those uh, uh, de de developers or uh, 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 retailers who have got their first uh, products uh, labeled, um, uh, two things happen. I mean, one is that, I mean, for the second product, uh, that they are labeling actually is a lot faster. I mean, we've stabilized. I mean, we average of uh, uh, 10 days to uh, two weeks or so. Um, uh, but uh, it is also important that now they come back with more product. They wanted to differentiate the product in the market. And that's really uh, uh, very encouraging for us. So I think the change of uh, um, uh, cons uh, the, the, the developer's mindset and together together with the consumer demand for more secure, secure product, I'm really optimistic that moving forward, uh, I think we have a, a more sustainable and a more proactive industry to support uh, uh, the consumer needs. Thank you. Um, and just another question here which we've had is, um, we've talked already about mapping, but about how do we align those standards from other countries, from, you know, to, to how do we get those things together? What's sort of really you know, any, anything that you'd like to think sort of that we haven't talked about already that you think beyond mapping that could be helpful to pull that together? Yeah, I mean, the co-recognition as well. I mean, it's, it's being done. I think it's going to, to help bridge the gap a lot quicker. Um, to get there, I think there are going to have to be compromises in some instances, right? Because they're 
again, mostly covered out over the same aspects and standards, but not 100%. And so having those conversations um, and really working together and being open to those compromises, I think, is important. Um, but the co-recognition, I think, is, is great. And I think that that will be the biggest step. Great. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to say, I think we're getting towards an end now. And I just want to say, first of all, a huge thank you to everyone from sharing their perspective. Um, Dr. Shi, thank you so much for joining remotely and for sharing your perspective at Xiaomi. It, it's very, very exciting and interesting to hear about your, the scale of growth and also how things are moving and the work you're doing to try and keep security at the front and center. And thank you very much, Grace and Tahata and Tazlin Sum um, Tia, to uh, sharing us more um, about your various perspectives, both in developing labeling schemes and the incredibly exciting work you're doing in Japan to help assess where those problems are, helping consumers to, to know what's going on there and also the work you're doing to, to help draw together that range of perspectives into a, a sort of series of implementable standards, I suppose. And so I think, you know, for me, the, the five takeaways I've got is sort of there's a lot of consensus and the maps are a really helpful way to do that and we should really draw that consensus together. Um, this is a complex world um, and, you know, we talked about the range of products um, and, you know, there's, we have to balance, you know, proportionality between innovation and, and security. We have to make sure that we're not preventing um, an organization from making a product that they want to because of this need to security being the handbrake. Um, and of course, in, the, in legislation, it's really difficult because, you know, you have to build on existing legislation. You have to build on what's appropriate for your country, how it works in that setting. Um, you know, what works in one country won't work in another, and that's okay, but actually, because there's already quite a lot of consensus, so we can really try and draw that through. I think the third thing I thought about was secure by design. Secure, that has to be, you've got to design it into the products, um, and that importance of consumers at, as the end, at the end point of, our, of these products. And I think also just the importance to keep this conversation going. So, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful that, you know, hopefully in, uh, we'll be having a conversation later this year, and next year, which, um, uh, a global forum um, to talk about digital security and prosperity, which will be in Paris. And I'm looking forward to hopefully getting a chance to talk through some of this in more detail. But I just want to say thank you very, very much for everyone for, for their contributions to this conversation. Really grateful for those who joined remotely and for those in the room. Thank you very, very much. And uh, thank you very much to the CSA. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Stevens and our panelists. Please do kindly remain on stage. We would actually like our guests to take a group photograph together, including Mr. Tsui as well. So if we can get our photographer up front. Maybe let's try one with all of you seated first. Would we like to get another one with all of you standing and up at the front of the stage? Thank you very much to all of our guests and for that wonderful panel discussion that we had on stage earlier. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of the International IoT Security Roundtable Leadership Dialogue 2022. We hope you've enjoyed today's program. We would like to thank you for being with us this session, and we hope to see you back here at 2.45 for the signing of the Mutual Recognition Arrangement on Cybersecurity Label between BSI Germany and CSA Singapore. We'll see you later.